making sure we're going to see the um, first things first, business. Need more? Can you hear me? There. Okay, good. Okay, we need more. First things first, um, we have a uh, board going around with a piece of yellow paper, a couple of papers to sign your name. So please do so. And do print clearly if you can. Um, in English. That works here. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end of the uh, session, I'll get that and get it on to Margaret Newhouse, who will take care of it. Um, well, I'm very excited. I'm glad you're here uh, to have our guest speaker. Uh, let me just tell you something about him briefly, and then he'll, he'll finish that. Uh, it's Dr. Sulana Amin, and um, he's had quite a career. Um, first of all, he speaks many languages, English, of course, Hindi, Chinese, Russian. Good enough. <laughs> Which is, uh, yes, excellent. And I think there are a few more there, too. Um, Dr. Ahmed, let me just do this so you can hear me. Dr. Ahmed um, is an expert in economic development in developing countries especially in Asia. And he's worked extensively, obviously, in Bangladesh and in China. He was chief technical advisor at the International Poverty Reduction Center in Beijing for uh, how many years? Oh, two years. He's a professor and a scholar in the area of development management and economic development worldwide. He's taught in universities in Asia and in the United States. He is currently director uh, of an NGO known as BRAC, which is uh, meaning Bangladesh, uh, see what? Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee. Rural Advancement Committee. And uh, it's an NGO in Bangladesh. He's going to tell you more about that. Uh, when, he, when he comes up. And I should also say he was a Fulbright Scholar uh, in 2004, 2005 uh, in the area of policy, advocacy, and development. And he is also a graduate of a uh, management program from Harvard University. <laughs> um, let me just end it there and have him come up. He's going to tell you about his career, uh, about his experiences in Asia, and most critically about his knowledge So we have our own accents. 
And uh, so my English has become very disruptive. Uh, I hope you understand. If you don't understand, please raise your hand, stop me, and uh, tell me, and please repeat or whatever. So, so this is uh, this is Bangladesh, and this is the map of Bangladesh. And uh, we see the capital city is Dhaka, and uh, Chittagong is the port city. And we have a three sides of India. And on the, the right hand side, we have a little bit of Burma or Myanmar. And uh, these are the basic statistics of Bangladesh. Well, the developed countries have branded us as a poor country, but I don't brand ourselves as a poor country. I think that Bangladesh is a is an economically poor country, but human resource-wise, we are a rich country, and we are the eighth largest country in the world, population-wise. Uh, the statistics will tell us that it's a it's an economically uh, poor country, but uh, I think the government, the NGOs, the rulers, the business people have basically failed to uh, channelize the human resources we have in the proper direction. And that's why we have this poverty. Poverty is a huge problem in Bangladesh. So if you look at the statistics, you find that, well, it's a fairly economically poor <coughs> country, but we are moving ahead, for example, if you look at the exports, main exports of garments, you know, garments are dresses and uh, shirts and jackets which we make for the Western market. And the major market is the US. And 80% of foreign exchange earning comes from garments industry. So you can imagine the contribution. But garments industry also employs uh, many women. Okay? Most of the employee, employees of garments industries uh, are women. Maybe millions of uh, women are working in the uh, The other, the other exports are tea, jute, fish. You know, this is a good export of Bangladesh. Fish is mainly exported to India. You know, they love this hilsa fish uh, from Bangladesh. If there are Indians here, they can uh, <laughs> they can certify it. And uh, and we are now having industries which are uh, developing in cement and pharmaceuticals. And recently, we got a uh, license from our uh, permission from the uh, standards institutions in UK to export our medicines or our to the UK. And we're trying to get the license from FDA. So that's, that's basically Bangladesh. As I said, it's a small country, very wide, but it's a big country uh, uh, population wise. Uh, and we have, we have a big poverty, which has reduced. I mean, if you look at the um, Statistics during independent, after independence, 75% of our people were very poor. Now we have 31% who are very poor. So it's improving. Uh, per capita income is low. Uh, we have also done excellent in population growth rate because 1.4% uh, is a reasonable growth rate compared to our cultures, our location, and the size of the population. So uh, we have done much better than Pakistan. You know, we were part of Pakistan before 71, and our population growth rate was 3%. And Pakistan has, Pakistan was, uh, Western Pakistan was a minority in Pakistan. We were the majority. Um, but uh, now they have overtaken Bangladesh as far as population is concerned. So in that sense, we have done very well. In, in spite of the fact that we have a conservative Muslim dominated society. BRAC is an organization which was uh, started way back in 1972, right after independence. And this is a unique kind of knowledge. I worked in this organization for 25 years. And uh, lastly, I was the pro vice chancellor, equivalent to your vice president <coughs> of BRAC University. We now have a university. And this is a really unique, a unique organization. So I'm going to discuss with you but how this organization evolved over the years, over the last 40 years, and uh, what it is doing. It started right after independence. It started as a relief organization because uh, as a result of the, uh, of the uh, liberation war, there were many refugees who went to India. They came back after independence, and we had to rehabilitate them. We had to provide relief to them because the economy was devastated and their villages were burnt, and uh, that's why there was a requirement. And we had no government as such. The government basically 
doing from India and we started to, to start serving government. And so everybody wanted to do something for rehabilitating and providing relief to these refugees coming back from India. This is a big task for Bangladesh. And so individuals started, government started, everybody started. So that's how this organization started in 1972. And it was named Bangladesh Relief and Rehabilitation Assistance Committee. Okay? It was black or right, but it was Bangladesh Rehabilitation Assistance Committee. We learned a lot by working with the people in the villages. Uh, in 72, it was relief. In 74, 76, it was community development. It was interesting because uh, I was not part of that organization at that time. I came into Brack in 1979, but uh, I know about this story. Uh, and uh, we wanted to organize villagers into groups and uh, generalize resources so that the poor people would benefit. But as we went along, we found that gold would be not better because the elites, the resourceful persons, and the influentials siphoned away the resources which we mobilized from the poor people. So the poor people really started teaching us uh, what to do. And so from 76 onwards, we got involved in developmental work. And it was the poor who told us that relief is okay, but relief cannot solve our problems permanently. So can you do something developmental? And that's when we started working with the poor people directly. And we discovered a community within the community. And that were the poor people in Bangladesh. And the percentage was very high at that time. So what does it do? Over the years, you know, these programs have been organized better have been made more professional, and we have learned so much from the villagers and also from the experts. And ultimately, we have now some solid programs directed towards the poor people. One is microfinance. Now, microfinance is known all over the world, and it basically uh, germinated in Bangladesh. And everybody knows Dr. Hughes, right? You must have heard about Gami Bank and Dr. Hughes. Well, Dr. Yunus is the person who also was involved in microfinance, and his organization is called Ramin Bank, Rural Bank. Ramin in Bangladesh is rural. And he also got Nobel Prize for Peace by doing this microfinance in Bangladesh. But Ramin Bank is a one-track organization, meaning they only do microfinance. BRAC is a multifaceted organization because we understood poverty from a different perspective realistic perspective. Poverty is not an income issue only. Poverty is also an issue of lack of access. For us, poverty is lack of access to land, lack of access to health, lack of access to education, lack of access to income, of course, lack of access to governments. Because governments, poor people don't have access to governments. So organizations which want to do something for the poor people have to be a comprehensive organization. And that's how we started with microfinance, and we are now covering 10 million women in Bangladesh. It's an amazing program, and, uh, and repayment rates uh, are extremely high. The poor people have proven that they are more bankable than the rich. And if you look at the uh, repayments of our banks in Bangladesh, you'll find the rich, rich people don't repay properly. And many or many people take loans and vanish to the United States. It's amazing how they find ways not to repay. But the poor people have proven that they are much better repairs and they utilize their money much better than many of us. That's one program. The other program is education for children. One of the problems of our countries, developing countries, is education, especially children. You know? And when you look at these issues of education, you find that the, uh, the dropouts from the primary schools is quite high. And most of the dropouts are basically the poor children. They cannot afford for many reasons. And we did a long research. And that research found out two amazing things, among many things, among uh, other things. One is that you know, if, you, if you want to sustain your child through the primary education system, you have to have either of the two things. 
One is you have to have money so that you can be private tutors at home to support the child. And these private tutors are basically also coming from the schools themselves. If you don't have money, if you have high literacy rate, like people like us, you know, I was supporting Shazra when she was a child because I was educated, I could support her. But the poor people have neither of these. They don't have money, they don't have literacy. So there's no question that their children cannot survive in these schools. So then we have to develop a program which will take care of all the educational needs of primary education in the school itself. So we develop this non-formal primary education for children of the poor of age. And it started in 85 with only 22 pilot schools. But now it has expanded, you know, and now we have 35,000 primary schools uh, providing five years of education to children of poor community. And these are amazing schools. And we also have incorporated another 21,000 schools, which are preschools, pre-primary schools. So this is one of the, one of the, uh, I would say star programs of Brighton. This is being replicated all over the world, especially in developing countries. Uh, uh, and we have been uh, very successful with this program. The third program is, uh, you may have a good microfinance program, you may have a good education program, but unless you provide services for the primary health care of poor people, there's no way that these children can sustain. And that's why we went into primary health care. We learned from China. <laughs> Because China had these barefoot doctors in their village. They have now, they have now abandoned it. I've seen in China, they have abandoned it because they have improved their uh, health services in the villages. So they, they don't need barefoot doctors anymore now. But I, I believe by visiting Chinese villages, they still need barefoot doctors, especially if they had it. And so this one is interesting that we have uh, one barefoot woman doctor trained in 10 basic diseases for 300 households in every village in Bangladesh. Okay, this is in addition to what the government is doing. Because the government basically provides services from centers, from fixed centers. And so we are, primarily we are, what we are doing is we are trying to supplement what the government is doing and reaching these services to the poorest people. That's, uh, that's primarily what we are for. The fourth program is, uh, of course, the poor people also need a lot of capacity building training and capacity. You see, interestingly, these programs evolved over the years. And I think this organization has been constantly learning and innovating as we've been going on. And this was an essence of the, uh, the expansion or scaling up of this organization over the years. Because the learning was from the grassroots, and we incorporated those learning and developed down-to-earth programs. This is a problem with many organizations. You know, uh, many organizations uh, feel that they know everything, so why should they ask the poor people what can the poor people teach them? But if you really want to make a difference, that, that learning has to be done, come, has to come from the poor people, from the people themselves. And it makes a lot of sense. Uh, one of the things I can, I can uh, verify is that when I joined BRAC in 1979 after my PhD, I was, I didn't know much about poor people. Although I, I was born and grew up in Bangladesh, my family has come from the villages. But my family has come from semi-elitist villages, right? So my ideas about the poor people came from my periodic visits to the villages, to my grandfather's home or grandmother's home. And we went there to have fun. We did not know or we did not understand exactly what were the problems of the poor people. Then in 79, I went to the villages from the side of the poor people because bread was going to the poor people. And so my concern was different. So my passion became different. And I learned so much that I, I felt that I did not learn things properly in the universities because I was willingly going away from our roots. Okay, because the more I felt the more educated I became, I was going away from my own roots. And when I went back to the villages from the side of the poor, I could appreciate more, understand more the problems of the poor. For example, I thought 
And that was the education I had in my family, in my school, in my, in my university, that women in the villages should stay home. They should not come out to work. That's what our culture says. I did not believe that poor people's children needed education. But I thought that poor people's children should have the parents in the feet or in the households. So why should they need education? But when I went to the villages from Greg's side, I understood that everybody, every parent, wanted to educate their children. You know, every woman wanted to get more empowered and work outside if opportunities are given. And, and these issues have been well documented in a book, in books by Professor Amartya Sen. If you have an opportunity, read his book, Development as Freedom. A wonderful book. And he talks about poverty issues. And he's a, he's a Bengali uh, economist, but Indian Bengali. And he uh, also went to work for the economics. Yeah. And he's an extraordinary economics. And my economics, which I learned in university, I, I felt that these were not really relevant for the poor people in Bangladesh. I want to say it's more relevant now. So these are, uh, so training and capacity building is a need for the poor people. So we have to set up training centers, we have now training centers all over the country. And uh, providing training in leadership communication skills and also in occupational skills. It's not enough to give bank finance because you have to also develop the skills to utilize that microfinance for different purposes. And that's what this training and capacity building of the poor does. So this organization was founded in 1972 by Mr. F. H. Abed. And Mr. F. H. Abed is still alive and going strong. He's the chairman of the board now. He was the executive director. And uh, he was recently, I think two years ago, he got the uh, award for British government, the highest award, uh, which is, he was knighted by the British government, so he's, a, he's no longer Mr. Abbott, he's a Sir Abbott, which we hate in Bragg. We don't want to, we don't replicate the government uh, Sir culture in Bragg, so we, we have another culture, we say uh, brother or sister in our organization. That's another story. And so Mr. Abbott, he went off after the liberation of Bangladesh, he went off to the villages with 50 people. It's interesting, Mr. Abe was an accountant, okay? but he was a visionary accountant. His combination sometimes doesn't do not match uh, in accountants. But uh, he did an excellent job uh, when he was working. He was the accountant of the Shell Oil Company, a young man. But he, two, two things, changed his way of thinking and, and future course of life. One was the, uh, the uh, big cyclone of 1970 in Bangladesh, where thousands of people died. Islands were just washed away by that cyclone and had surge. The second was this liberation war in Bangladesh. And he decided that I should do something for the people in this country. And so he went off, he left, uh, he left uh, Shell Oil, he went, he went to uh, UK, because he studied in UK, and he started mobilizing money to help the freedom struggle. And after independence, he came and went with 50 graduate staff, graduates from the universities, went to the villages and started working with the refugees. That's how it all started. Now, Bragg has expanded so much we, we now have 150,000 staff members uh, in Bangladesh, but also outside Bangladesh now. And uh, we have a budget of 800 million US dollars. And uh, you know, 15 years ago, this budget was basically not, not this much, but the budget was 100% foreign donation dependent. But uh, as an accountant, he always thought of that you should be cost conscious, number one, and you should try to become as self-reliant as possible. And that's what we did. And I'll tell you the story because we went to business later on. Okay? And um, so at the moment of this budget, 75% is generated from within Bangladesh through microfinance, through businesses, 
to enterprises. Okay? That's how we generate money for financing REX development programs. It's, it, it's now become a combination of social entrepreneurship and business entrepreneurship. It's a very interesting kind of organization. And so it's one of the finest examples in the world okay, in the following fields. Social entrepreneurship. Marketing and branding. We have learned uh, from the business uh, schools. Marketing and branding and uh, incorporate this here. And it is a, a, a big example in scaling up. Most of the NGOs were well, NGOs. Uh, I, I personally don't like this terminology NGOs. NGO terminology was given by the UN system to us because the UN is a government to government organization. And when they started financing or funding uh, organizations beyond the government, they said, okay, they are non government. But, but basically, this terminology does not explain what we do. So I don't like this terminology. It's a, it, it's a, a starting point, it has, at the start of itself, it has a negative kind of connotation. We said, well, it's, it's better to call ourselves as private development organization or development organizations in the private sector. That's a much better term. So I call ourselves as PDO, private development organization. So it is, a, it is an example in scaling up because it scaled up many of its programs nationwide. And it is now scaling up in the international arena as well. And you can imagine having two schools in 1985 and having 35,000 schools in 2012, it's a huge expansion. And also adding 21,000 schools for, uh, for the uh, pre-primary schools. And microfinance has expanded from a few hundred women to 10 million women. And, and you can imagine the expense of scaling up. And we learned a lot about scaling up. I, I remember I wrote a paper on scaling up and presented it internationally. What we learned from scaling up, how did we scale up? And we're now learning about internationalization because BREC has now expanded because many countries, developing countries, have been requesting BREC to share its experiences with their own uh, countries. You know. So we went, uh, first we went to uh, Afghanistan because uh, Afghanistan, interestingly, has many similarities with Bangladesh. You know, in, in, what Afghanistan was in 2001, Bangladesh was exactly the same in 1971. It was a war-ravaged country, and people were uh, having a lot of problems as far as uh, food, employment, etc. So rehabilitation was concerned. And so we thought that maybe we could share some of our uh, learning to Afghan uh, people. So we sent a delegation, we sent a group to Afghanistan to discuss with the people. Afghanistan people, the government welcomed us. They said, what did you please come? We are the first southern NGO coming to a southern country to implement. So, and, and, and one thing they said very interesting, when we went to the villages, I didn't go, but the group went and I heard the stories. When uh, they went to the villages, the villagers said something very interesting. They said, you should come because you are our Muslim brothers. You know? Secondly, you don't have a common border with us. Whoever has a common border with us has problems with us. Please come and help us. This was something interesting. So we went to Afghanistan. Then we went to uh, Sri Lanka. Because Sri Lanka had this tsunami. And after that, uh, there were a lot of uh, requirements in the country for alleviating tsunami disasters and also alleviating suffering of people. So we went to Sri Lanka. Later on, we went to Pakistan. Pakistan was interesting because Pakistan has been teaching us for 25 years. All of a sudden, Bangladesh was teaching Pakistan. So we were very happy to, to go to Pakistan and, and share our, uh, our learning to the Pakistan. Uh, then Africa also wanted us to go there. So we went uh, to these countries over the years and we have started implementing programs. Now, interesting that uh, you cannot replicate developmental programs. We have seen this here. Development programs, developmental programs can be learned, but each country has its own circumstances, own cultures, own ways of doing things. That's why 
learning from one country can be adapted but cannot be adopted in another country. And that's what we saw in these countries. A lot of adaptations had to be done in the uh, education program, in the microfinance program, or in the health program. Uh, in Afghanistan, for example, it was very hard to get girls only schools. We have in Bangladesh 70% girls, 40% uh, 30 uh, uh, boys in our schools, so we want to promote women's literacy. But in Afghanistan, it was very difficult. So they said, if you, if you want to run schools, you please have separate schools for girls and boys. So that's what we did. And so we had to do these adjustments. And these are constant adjustments being done in, in other countries. So REC is now learning how to internationalize. But I would say that uh, uh, you know, REC has to uh, implement programs for some time. But ultimately, these organizations have to devolve to, the, to those countries. That is the right strategy for REC. It's now already 10 years we're not working. So maybe in the next five to 10 years, we should devolve uh, and create the leadership create the staff and create the managers in those countries. That will help them more. That's what we saw in Bangladesh. I mean, in, in 72, there was an influx of international organizations. Then, BRAC was basically a marginal actor organization. In 2000, it became the other way around. So international organizations, they said that, you know, BRAC and Brahmin and others are doing much better. So we better concentrate on that poor countries. That's what happened in Bangladesh. It was an interesting learning. So BRAC has become a household name in Bangladesh. In, in, in the business world, they say that it's a, it's a, it's a brand. Yeah. And so we, we, uh, we didn't know that it was a brand, but we used this name. So we have now used this name in different organizations. We now have a, a bank. It's called BRAC Bank. We now have a university with 5,000 students, BRAC University. We have several uh, BRAC management and training centers all over the country in Bangladesh. And we also have a housing finance corporation, and we have a printing press. So you can imagine how many, how many uh, enterprises have spun off from from BRAC as, as an organization. It's it's fascinating how how these organizations have been helping BRAC to become more and more self-financed. Arbon is another brand. Uh, we found out gradually that BRAC, the name BRAC was known all over the country. So it was a brand for all in the country, especially the poor people. But then we also created other products. For example, we had a marketing outlet for handicrafts of the poor people producing in the villages. So we created shops in the cities and we named it Arlo. It was a small shop in 78. And it was named Arlo because Arlo is a Bangla word. It means a small fair, a small market. And uh, so now, gradually, it became, it expanded, it scaled up, and now we have about 12 outlets, and uh, there are about 40,000 women who are supported by Aron. So Aron has become a brand which is more known in the cities because these product, products are sold in the cities, but it is not known in the villages because Aron shops are basically in the cities, right? So Aron has, has now uh, come up with other, other products such as uh, dairy and meat products. We produce uh, our own milk, we produce our own butter, we produce our own tea. In fact, we learned this technology from the Indians. The Indians have a fascinating uh, cooperative called Amul Dairy. You know? And I've seen Amul butter in, even in America, so uh, And so we got this, uh, we learned this from the Indians. You know, Brack as an organization sends people to to anywhere they want to learn, you know, and bring, and bring back the learning the knowledge. Then we have Aaron Yogurt, and that, these are the few things we have uh, produced over the last ten years. Now, I just want to conclude my presentation by uh, by citing some success factors. You know, I, when I studied uh, uh, an executive program, masters in business, they taught us the logic of an organization. Basically, I didn't understand why they said logic of the organization. Basically, they meant that the logic of the organization means the key success factors of an organization. This was way back in the mid-80s. So maybe this terminology is never used now in the business schools. Do you use it? No. The logic, the logic of an organization. Success factor. 
Yeah, you use the success factor, but we were taught in the business school in Philippines, you must understand the logic of an organization. Okay. So that will be done. But basically, this key success factor. Okay, the first one is the spirit of independence. Bangladesh was always, Bengalis in Bangladesh were always ruled by outsiders. And this is the first time that we became independent and we wanted to do something for us. You know? We're still making mistakes. And if you look at the political uh, happenings in Bangladesh, we're still making mistakes. But we are progressing, I would say. We have our own things in our own hands. So this spirit of independence was a big success. Second was continued and dedicated leadership. He created the leadership. Mr. Abed was instrumental in capacity building, in leadership and management. And this was a continuous process that was going on even now. And this was an, an extraordinary uh, uh, good success factor for uh, Brad. The staff were trained to be value driven, and we were value driven. Meaning, concern for the poor was the highest in our, in our spirits, the, uh, especially for women. Honesty, integrity, cost consciousness, attitude to listen and learn. All of these were part of our culture, and we promoted it through continuous training. As I said, understanding poverty as a comprehensive problem. Poverty is not a one dimensional problem. Microfinance cannot solve our problems. Microfinance is one of the instruments to solve the poverty problem, but it has to be comprehensive. It has to be, uh, you know, making education, health, uh, land rights, women's rights, all kinds of things available to these poor people so that they can function as a, as a citizen of the country. Okay? If you look at us, you know, I can tell you that most of the elites in our country basically dysfunction for the poor people. And that's why I think that we have sided with the poor and we have to unlearn a lot of things, what we learned earlier, to become, I call ourselves as alternate elites. Okay? That's what we're doing. So we understood poverty in a very different circumstances. Listening. I have seen in, in my 30 years of crack, I've interacted with many organizations, I've interacted with United Nations, I've interacted with the government and governments of the world. And I feel, I felt, and I still feel, that the higher you get in the echelon of power, the less you listen. Because you feel that I know everything. Okay, teaching. And I feel it, I feel it every day, every time I met the government you know, in our countries. So many people don't listen. It's a big problem. If you don't listen, you cannot develop problems. You cannot become functional. And this organization has been constantly innovative. Constantly. Whether it's microfinance, or it's uh, education, or health, whatever. It has been constantly fine-tuning and innovating these programs and coming up with newer ideas and newer programs. And as I said, over, over the years, this has been a <coughs> continuous process of capacity. Capacity building of management, capacity building of leaders, capacity building of operational staff. And this organization also provides a lot of emphasis on research and evaluation. We, in fact, we have a big division of research and evaluation where we have at least 50 uh, professional research staff and they give a lot of feedback to the program, programmers from the field. So that's all I have to say for, for this presentation. You know, it's, it's hard to present Greg uh, over a period of 40 minutes or 30 minutes uh, to tell the story in 30 minutes, but I, I, I tried that. And uh, if you have questions, I'm, I'm ready to answer. If, if time does not permit, I'll be here for some more time. I have a cup of tea with you and you can ask questions. So thank you very much for your rapt attention.
And, and people coming from the West sometimes tell us, like, why do you, you keep saying thank you? I say, I say that, you know, thank you is, is in, our, in our expressions. You don't say the word, but it's in our expressions. It's in our eyes, it's in our smiles, it's in our body language. But we don't use the word thank you so much in Bangladesh. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. It's hard, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult, it takes a lot of time. But what we, what we learned, for example, I was once in Africa, in Zimbabwe. And in Zimbabwe, there's a proverb which says, it goes like this, please listen carefully. If you have your hand in someone else's pocket, if that person moves, you have to move. <laughs> right? We understood that because we used to get funding from different sources, mostly international sources. And sometimes these funding organizations were highly demanding in their own ways, not understanding always our own problems. And so we had to listen to them. We had to, we had to move them. But we didn't like that. So, and that's one reason why from the very beginning, from 1978, we started thinking about becoming more and more self-reliant. You know, and now we have money which we can use ourselves. For example, donors might not give us money to create Brecht University. Why should donors give us money for Brecht University? So we have to generate money from within, from the businesses, and then start the university. We initially need a lot of investments in the university. And so it took time, you know, it took a lot of time. For the first, I would say, 10 years, we did not have any local funding, I mean, or, or generated any income. But gradually we understood that if you use your money yourself, your own money yourself, you use it better, and also you don't have to listen to wrong demands by the donors, sometimes, you know. Not always, sometimes. And that's why we constantly uh, want to become self -reliant. Even now we are not separate because some of our programs cannot generate money. Like the non formal primary education program is a large program, but it cannot generate some more money because primary education in Bangladesh is free. Okay? And if you open this program, this is such a good program, if you open this program for the public for, to recruit or to uh, enroll on payment, it will be hijacked by the rich people. So the poor people cannot afford. And if you open it up, the rich people will take it away. Because they will not send their children to these schools. And the poor people's children will again be marginalized. Right? So it takes an effort, you know, but it also takes a vision. It has to be a vision which you want to reach. It's not a dream. You know, there's a big difference between dreams and visions. Dream is a dream. I can dream that I want to become the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. That's a dream. I've never become a Prime Minister of Bangladesh. I don't want to become a Prime Minister of Bangladesh. But I can dream. But if you have a vision, that means you can translate that dream into action. Then it becomes a vision. And that's what happened in practice. We, from the very beginning, we thought and we, uh, we, uh, we decided that we should become more and more self reliant Because we, we were not very really happy with the uh, the kind of uh, donor demands which we were having. Sometimes it did not go with the interests of the poor people in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult complex <coughs> story. We faced that. So, I mean, that's a long answer to a short question. But basically, you have to have the vision. And you have to try to generate income innovatively from within the country. 
and we feel more safe with that. It's always good to be safe with that. Because the other thing is that you cannot, you cannot influence the donor's objectives, but you can influence your own objectives, right? So if the donors all of a sudden decide, I'm not going to fund any Bangladesh organization, it just goes down. And it has happened in Bangladesh. Some donors decided, Bangladesh is progress, what should I do? Finance Bangladesh organization, I go to Africa. So they took their money and went to Africa. But that organization collapsed. So this has happened. So these are kind of uh, ways to deal with this problem of uh, becoming self reliant But it's a, it's a difficult issue. And, and you have to be very committed to become self reliant as much as possible. Any other question? Yes. I think so. I, I, mean, I have an example, you know, um, because as I said, my notions about poverty, my notions about poor people were very different so before I joined Black and went to the villages from the side of the poor. So I think it's a good thing happening. Uh, and ultimately, uh, I think people like, people like us who are educated, who have been uh, trained by the society, and it's our responsibility to give back to the society. And that's what uh, I have learned, we have learned from, from Brad. So Brad was always a university for me, except that we did not get any papers from Brad, but we learned so much from, from our exposure to, to, the, to the villagers and the women. Uh, I mean, we have learned so much from the university. This school program, you know, basically it was initiated because of demands by the poor women. They said, we constantly heard this question when we were in the villages. We didn't have anything about children before 1985. But constantly we heard this question from the villagers, from the women, that you're doing good work in natural finance, you're doing good work in health, but can you do something for my child? Because my child cannot survive in the formal primary schools. Can you please do something? This bothered us, but we didn't want to get into this because we thought that our work should be with the adults. So we didn't want to get into extra work. But when we went into this and learned by research what was the problem, then we decided to get into this. And these women basically initiated that thinking process in Brack. So you have to listen. You know? Otherwise, you might have missed this opportunity. But now we are very proud to have this program in Bangladesh and also disseminating this program to other countries like Afghanistan and Africa. So this is an extraordinary kind of a satisfaction we receive from implementing such programs. You see, I, I, saw, I saw poverty in the U.S. I was in, uh, uh, some years ago, I, I did a uh, one-month program in, uh, in an advocacy institute in Washington, D.C. And during the third week, or fourth week, they sent us to see how advocacy is done. So we saw some examples. And I went to San Francisco to look at the issues of garments workers in San Francisco Bay. How do you call that? Bay, Bay Area or something. And we went to their homes. And I was surprised to see such poverty in America. It was surprising for me because I, I didn't find any difference between the garments workers in Bangladesh and garments workers in San Francisco. So the issues are still there. The only problem is, for us, poverty is a mainstream issue. You're talking about 31% of people in Bangladesh. 31%, 150 million people is a huge number, right? 135 million in China who are very poor is a huge number. Although, percentage-wise, 135 million of 1.3 billion is not much. You can say that, oh, we don't have poverty. But China has poverty. Bangladesh has poverty. US has poverty. The issue is that for us, it's a mainstream problem. So we constantly focus on poverty. Everybody talks about it, and everybody does something about poverty. For you, it's a marginal problem. 
So you forget about poverty in, in, in uh, US, but there are people who need support. There are interesting organizations also. And there are these kind of initiatives which, which is needed all over the world. You know, I wish there was no poor people in this world. And as I said, I also learned another thing from my 30 years of experience, that uh, the rich people are basically the unfair to poor people. The developed countries are basically unfair to developing countries. This is another learning I've got from my experience. Uh, if, I had, uh, if I had been 20 years younger, I could start something new in this direction, but I'm already 60 plus, so I don't have much time, but I, I try to go back to, I'm going back to one of those new number, and, and uh, I worked for 30 years, but I'm going to work for another, at least 10 years, to really dig into these issues. Of, of poverty and uh, unfairness in this world. And these are complex issues, I think, very complex issues. But I wish, no matter where you are, as young people, don't forget the bottom 10-15% people in our countries. Please remember them. Because I feel that uh, it's a crime so many people live in such appalling conditions in our countries, whereas you have efforts all over. Tremendous efforts. The income difference in China between the rich and the poor is one of the highest in the world. 0 0.48 Gini coefficient. They have overtaken the United States. So I think I tell the Chinese that focus on the poor people. There's a way only 10% poverty. It's a 10% means 1.3 billion, 1 .3 billion people you have. 10% is a lot of people. So I think no matter where you are working, please don't forget the bottom 10, 15 percent people in this world. They are in dire need of support. Dire need of support. And uh, you, are, you are the fortunate of the world. If you go to these schools, you know, 35,000 schools, we cannot do much after grade five. Now we are developing all kinds of programs so that they can continue their education in high schools. It is happening, but very slowly. You know? But we need a lot of support. And that's why I think that you know, when you see these children in these schools, you, you, become, you become energized. If you stay in Dhaka, the capital city of Bangladesh, you become very frustrated. You know, they all talk, Bangladesh has no future, the people are dying, this country will, will become the basket case which was set by Kissinger in 1972, and that still remains. But if you go to the villages and see these initiatives of microfinance and the, the rural children become energized, you know, and you feel, you feel that there is hope in our countries, in our people. And I wish that the rich countries also had that kind of an, a vision for the world. Anything else? So thank you very much. It was, uh, it was wonderful. I'm really thankful that I could come here and professor of organizing this. I'm really grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you.